Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we, uh, we're in, we're in need of some people to help us to get to camp. Um, we uh, have people that are coming up later. And so if you have a vehicle, you'd be willing to drive. Um, if you had a truck, that would be great. Um, put some stuff in it. But we need to get uh, some of the materials, some of the campers up there. Because we have other people that are coming up later on in the week. So if you can see me or Kathy after service today and let us know if you'd be available to do that, we would really appreciate it. And even if you were available, possibly to come up on Sunday uh, morning to help bring people back, we would appreciate that as well. So if you could let us know, uh, we, we really could use your help, okay? Um, we've been talking uh, about, uh, over the last few weeks, about just... Uh, uh, being uh, uh, in a situation where God can call us to, to do great things through uh, all different areas of our lives. And uh, we're going to talk about today about uh, being vessels that God uses. Um, and uh, uh, we're in uh, actually in Isaiah chapter 6, in the beginning of that, and also in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2. We're going to be uh, in that, in verses 20 and 21. Um, in, in, in the idea of being a person that God uses, it's, uh, you know, I can, I can take an inan uh, inanimate object and take it like a cup or whatever, and it doesn't really have a will, so to speak, and I can use it for whatever purpose that I want. But you and I can have opportunities to, to decide of what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Uh, we kind of have to come into this place where we're going to actually um, decide whether or not we're going to allow God to use us. And so uh, uh, being this useful vessel today, uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, uh, it says in verse 1, And the king that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him were seraphs, uh, each one, uh, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And with, uh, with it, he touched his mouth and said, See, this, I didn't tell her this verse, but in, in, maybe I did. Uh, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go with us? And then also we're looking at, at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 20. <coughs> in a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes, and some for uh, uh, ignoble. If a man cleanses himself of the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. All right, let's pray. Lord, I come to you today, and I specifically, Lord, come to you Asking, Lord, that you bless this time together. I pray, Father, that you would uh, speak to our hearts. There's so many challenging things in the world. Um, there was a situation in Lodi where there was, um, you know, a sporting event. And people had to, started fighting with one another. People getting all upset. Even at something that we're supposed to, is supposed to be fun and supposed to be enjoyable. There's so much hatred and malice and animosity in the world for each other. And so, Lord, today, God, I come to you and I ask you, Lord, that you can bring peace to our hearts. 
God, that you can give us a strength and an encouragement in these days and times in which we sometimes shake our head at the ignorance of people. Lord, that you can help us to know that there is a lasting peace and a greater purpose than what we can see so many times on the surface. I pray, Father, that you help us to have a heart of love. I pray, God, that you help us to be people that looks at others, realizing, Lord, you know, that that could be us at any given time. God, may we have compassion and may we love without reservation. I pray, Lord, that you help me to preach today with passion and with boldness. And help me to preach today, Lord, as if I'd never ever get to do it again. In Jesus' name, amen. There was a guy who had received a, a call um, from a, a, a missionary in Japan who was in her 80s. And she called this guy out of the blue, and she had been serving in Japan for over 50 years years, 58 years, and she used to be his teacher when he was a, a Bible student, and she asked him, she said, you know, we're looking for a pastor to look after our church, and as we're leaving for a new mission to plant a church, and we're short on pastors, and we need a person like you in the churches in Japan. The guy couldn't sleep that night, he had a burden that was on his heart after this phone call for the churches and for this uh, uh, this call to help, and he couldn't ignore it. And a passage of Proverbs came to his mind. He says, in Proverbs 3.27, it says, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due, and when it is in your power to do it. That verse touched his heart, and it showed him clearly that the purpose of his life was to, to, to not just be comfortable uh, pursuing his hobbies, but to to live for Christ and to do some things that were maybe out of his comfort zone and to help those that needed it. He also remembered what Jesus said. And he said, the Son of Man, God came to seek and to save that which was lost in, June, in, in Luke 19.10. And so he was that day challenged to be a useful vessel. A vessel that could be used by God to do great things and to actually do them in a foreign country to do them in Japan. Do you know that God created you for a purpose? That God specifically created you for a purpose here on this planet? That you're not here by mistake? That you're not here just out of uh, just a sure uh, whimsical thing? That you and I are, are, are purposely created? That the Creator loves you and I so much that He's, he, he distinctly created you and He made you and I, each one of us individually, the apple of his eye. And so he's calling us to be that creature that, that loves him. Everything created for a purpose. A chair created for us to sit on. A bed created for us to sleep in. A piano made for us to play music on. Nature created for God to declare his glory through. The Bible says heaven declares the glory of God and the sky proclaims the work of his hands. In Psalm 19. Mountains, seas, and stars, all of these things, all of nature declares the glory of God. Flowers, bloom, birds, sing, all of it declaring God's glory. You, as I, you and I as human beings are created to glorify God. Like the moon that shines at night Reflecting its light so all of us can even have some light to see and to walk around at night. God shines through Jesus in a dark, sinful world, reflecting his light. It would be very sad if you and I, as God's creation, were not used according for his intended purpose. If you and I buy a car, brand new, and you never use it, what a waste of money. It's nice. You can tell everybody you have a brand new car. But good night, Irene. Why would you pay for something you're not going to use? You guys never heard that one before, huh? That's a new one. All right. I mean, geez Louise. All right. Heard that one before. All right, so, okay. Why would you use something 
Why would you buy something that you're, you're never going to use? Well, we do that with clothing all the time. Right? We buy clothes and then we put them in our closet and they look good. Then for some reason we go to try them on in the dark. They don't feel so good. They're a little tight here, a little tight there. And we say, ah, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dye it and I'm going to wear this stuff. Then, you know, four or five packages of Oreos later, uh, <laughs> you know, that sucker's still in the closet. We're not using it. It's not helping. We're, we're not there. And so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's very sad if we as God's creation are not used for His intended purpose. And so doing this, buying these cars, doing these things, Isaiah 43, 7 says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. God's referred to as a potter who takes clay and puts it on a potter's wheel and begins to mold and shape our life. If you see someone who's really good at that, man, they can make something pretty divine just with their fingers and their thumbs. And just with their feet, just moving that wheel. It's kind of amazing what they can do with their hands, how they can mold and shape. And if you and I will take ourselves and put ourselves in the hand of the potter, he can actually mold us and shape us into the image of his son. And he can do things for us and change us and shape us in, in ways that we, we uh, never knew. Because, you know, the potter, what he does with the pot is he designs the pot for the purpose of use that he wants. You're not going to take a little coffee cup and use it to boil water. It's a little small. Especially if you want a big pot of water. You want a big pot. And so you're going to shape something that's bigger, mold something that's bigger. We are the clay. You are the pot. We are all the work of your hands, Isaiah 64, 8. And then Romans 9, 21 says, Or does not the potter have the right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honor and another for common use? As a pot is one of these vessels, so we too as human beings are referred to as vessels of the master's use. Jesus said that Paul was a chosen vessel in Acts 9.15. It is very important that you and I realize that God wants to use us. And so I want to talk to you about how you and I, what kind of vessel would you use? What are the criteria? What are the, the things that you would ask for, for vessels to be used? What kind of person would God use? How can you and I be used as a vessel, as an instrument of God? Amazingly, we can think about a lot of different things. There's a lot of different answers that can be given. I have four things I want to talk to you about first. Number one, the first condition of a vessel being used is proximity, availability, accessibility. The vessel that's near the user is the one likely to be used. If I can go and get to a cup and it's the closest thing in my reach, that's what I'm going to grab for. That's the thing that I'm going to use. You and I, I mean, I'm just telling you, when I eat ice cream, ice cream, I use a baby spoon. <laughs> Laugh all you want to. I don't eat ice cream as fast as you because I have a baby spoon. And I'm enjoying it way more than you're enjoying it because you're wolfing it down probably with a tablespoon. <laughs> I got a baby spoon. We can hear you eating yours because you're wolfing it down so loud with your big old giant spoon. I'm being very quiet with my little teeny baby spoon. I can just hear all of you now chomping on your ice cream right now. It's, it's actually just disgusting when I think about it. Yes. I'll pray for all of you later. The standard that you and I for, for, for something to be used, that standard is availability. Many times what we do is it's the closest thing. When you go to reach for a cup or a glass, most of the time it's not the fact that you're maybe looking for something special, but
but it's that thing that's closest. That's what you grab. That's what you take a hold of. That's what you're going after. It, it has to be in a convenient place. It has to be a, a short distance from the user. The vessel that is near to the user is the one that's going to be used. The user's not going to bother to use a vessel that's out of its reach. No matter how clean, no matter how pretty, no matter how nice, no matter what, if you can't reach it, if you can't grab it, how can you use it? How can God use you and I as a vessel for His work and for His kingdom if we're so far away from Him? How can God grab a hold of us and use us as this vessel if we won't get close to Him on a daily basis like He's asked us to do and like He wants us to do? God is wanting us constantly to, 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 to do these things and wants us to do them. How expensive and how precious that a cup might be. Would you use it if it takes a long time to go get it? Are you going to waste all your time to go get a cup just because it might be your favorite cup? Well, maybe, maybe you're like me. Maybe sometimes you have this favorite cup and you just turn around and you just wash it every time. I'm not sure. But the whole idea of it is, is that God wants us to realize that there's that proximity, that accessibility, that availability is the first condition of you and I being a vessel that can be used. There was a guy who applied for a job as a handyman. The employer asked him, can you uh, do carpentry? He said, no. What about bricklaying? Nope. He said, well, what about electrical work? Uh-uh. I don't know anything about that. Finally, he said, well, then tell me, what are you, what's handy about you? He said, I, I just live around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> don't you know that sometimes accessibility is the key to success? Sometimes it's not all the giftings that you think you have. It's just the fact that you're close enough proximity to God that God could actually use you. How about that? Sometimes we think that our giftings are so great that, you know, God just has to pick us because look, look at all the stuff that I can do. I've got all this stuff going on in my life. Look how great I am. God really needs me. And the fact of the matter is that God really doesn't need us. He wants people who are willing. No matter if they feel like they have the gifting or not, <laughs> that they will do that. Our greatest ability is availability. To where God can call us, that He can whisper our name, that He can give a summons to us, and then a beginning of a life, a meaningful life, a meaningful discipleship can take place. Just like a house or a shop, we put it in a good location. You want a convenient place. To go, you want this place to be. It's in great demand. An accessible person, an available person is in great demand. Because sometimes all you need is just a hand to hold one of the corners. And if you know that every time you call, that that person is going to be there to hold their end up, how great of a value is that person? What if that's all they've ever done? is just hold their end up. Oh, damn, they're so valuable, you don't even know. I don't even know. But see, we don't get that sometimes because many times we're in situations where we're trying to hold their end up, we're trying to hold our end up. See, that's the tricky part, the big, big Newton. We, we try. I don't know if you guys ever used to, anyway, forget that. That's the whole thing. I'm going back to my childhood. There was an old commercial where the Fig Newton was actually standing on one leg. Anyway, it, it's the, it, that's, that's, the, that's the tricky part. The old commercial. We, we think that, that we can do it all on our own, but we don't have enough hands. We don't have enough feet. We don't have enough time. <laughs> we don't have enough energy to take care of all of this stuff. That it really doesn't work. That God is trying to to help us, and he's trying to prepare us for something. God says in James 4 8 that if you come near to God, that he will come near to you. Isaiah was near to God in the temple. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Because he was near to God, he, he could hear God's calling, and he could hear, and he could.
could answer, hear my Lord, said me. Samuel was near to God, living down in the house of the Lord, where the ark was. And the Lord called Samuel, and he said, hear my Lord. Because Samuel was near God, he was used mightily. What does it mean to be close to God? It means that you and I become conscious of God's presence. That we have an open heart to hear when God is speaking. That we'll actually stop talking long enough about ourselves and about our, our successes and about our problems and about our issues and about our stuff. And we'll stop talking long enough that we can actually hear God speak. Sometimes, don't you know that God just wants you to listen? He wants to speak and he can't get through all the drivel and the drool that is coming out of our mouth because we won't shut up long enough to let God speak. Our voice keeps overpowering the voice of God because we keep telling God all this stuff, but we're not listening. And if our children do that to us, we get upset. Listen, quit talking, and listen. God's trying to tell you and I, every once in a while, it would be nice if you would just silencio. <laughs> be quiet. El shut up, though. Right? Be quiet. Jump after jump 
thing that, that cannot be penetrated by normal, normal things. It cannot be penetrated by, by peace or love. It cannot be penetrated by anything on earth. It can only be penetrated by one. Because we build up this hard shell. And we will not allow people to love us. We will not allow people to dictate to us. We will not allow people to speak to us. We will not allow people to give us good advice. We will not allow this. And we will not allow that because, hey, buddy, don't talk about me because you don't know me. You don't know all the hurt that I've been through. I got you. But I know one who does. He knows all your hurt and all your pain. Matter of fact, he felt pain and went through pain, horrific pain, for you. He's, he went through greater pain than you've ever experienced. And he did it all for you. So you and I need to realize that we need to be an empty vessel. Something that, when, you know, when you, when you're, you're not going to go and say, okay, let's see, I got an empty cup and I got a full cup, but this full cup's been sitting here uh, for like two days. Which cup am I going to use? I'm going to use the one that's empty. I'm going to use the one that I can use. We, we, we keep going this. Even if the cup is near us, but it's full, we can't use it. We need to have a cup that's empty and clean before it can be used. No runner runs a race carrying a heavy bag. Even if you try to lose weight, you're going to be overweight for the race. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Paul and the crew on the ship threw the grain out of the ship to make it lighter as the ship was possibly going to sink in the storm in Acts 27. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. That's in Acts 27, 38. In order for you and I to save our to, in order for them to save their lives, they had to eliminate the things that were less important. They had to eliminate the things that were causing them to be set back and causing them to be dragged down. And in order for you and I to achieve the mission that God has called us to achieve, we often must eliminate the things that are less important. Because folks, there are things in your life and in my life that are dragging us down. There are things in your life and my life that are, if we're caught in a storm, they're going to cause us to drown. There are things in our life that is going to cause us to be bogged down to where we can't get our head above water because we're going to be dragged to the bottom with all this stuff that we're carrying. God is trying to share with us and the Lord is trying to tell us. There's a, an action novel character by the name of Jack Reacher. They made movies about him. And it's written by Lee Child. And he, he can do so many heroic deeds partly because he travels light. He doesn't carry a bag or a suitcase. He doesn't own a house, a car, even a watch. All he has except the clothes that he wears is some cash. He has nothing to lose. You and I cannot be used by God when our heart is full of pride and hope, full of worldly things. If our focus is nothing but just on becoming wealthy or becoming rich or becoming this or becoming that, if our focus is just on our career, if our focus is just on this, if our focus is just on having things, if our focus is just on our hobbies, if our focus is just on these things, how can God use us when our focus isn't on Him? He wants to use you and I. As a Christian, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. Do you know that if you're going to shoot at a target, it's probably smart to only have one target to look at. I guess unless you're using a machine gun. Hmm. You know? <laughs> but if you're just shooting at one target, that's
that's a good thing. You and I need to realize that we need to fix our eyes on Him. The more targets we have, the more difficult it is to shoot them all. Our success rate becomes less when our attention is divided in all different directions. It's difficult, I mean, unless you're in the circus, to ride two horses at the same time. Hmm. Normally you stick to one horse. Jesus said no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Matthew 6, 24. He also said that the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke out the word, making it unfruitful. Matthew 13, 12, or 13, 22. Do you know that there was a situation where the, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah was being burned to the ground because they wouldn't listen to the voice of God. They wouldn't turn away from their sin. And the Bible says that Lot's wife, they were told to leave. Lot, his wife, the three daughters, they were told to leave. But Lot's wife turned around and looked back. And the Bible says that she was immediately crystallized. She was turned into a pile of salt. Immediately. Don't you know that that's really where many of us are? Is that we're so ingrained and so deep into the world that our lives are so sh just shoveled into the world that we cannot get away from it. We've got to constantly keep turning around and looking back and taking a look at all the carnage that's going on. Let me tell you something. When you have the opportunity to escape this world, you need to run from it as fast as you can and quit looking back. There's nothing there for you. It's hate and deceit and lies. You need to, to do what God has always asked us to do. Is you need to focus on the one that you can trust. You need to focus on Him. You and I need to realize that God is the one that helps us. Okay? And then the third thing is a clean vessel. Even if the cup is near the user and empty, it is dirty and filthy if it has mold or stain. I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but, but Jesus kind of kind of made that thing. He said that the Pharisees were kind of guys that basically they like to look at it, making the outside of the cup look really nice, but when you grab it to drink it, it was just filled with garbage. It was filled with mold. It hadn't been washed in months. It was nasty to look at. He said what they wanted to do is they wanted to take and make the graves look pristine, make them look beautiful, make them so attentive, but even though they looked beautiful, they still were filled with dead men's bones. You and I can make everything look great on the outside. We can go to the gym all the time that you want to. You can have all the strength that you want to. Everything on the outside can just be pristine, but on the inside, it's ugly. It's terrible. It's mean. You and I need to realize that God is looking for vessels that are clean. And He wants to be the one to clean them up. So what would be I cried? I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. I have lived among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. The God, the, the, the Bible goes on to say in Isaiah 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs of the altar, and when he touched with the mouth, and said, This has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. If you and I, as sinful people, people with low moral, moral character, try to do God's work, sometimes in our trying, where we're at, trying to do things, sometimes it might even do more harm than good. God wants you and I to quit trying to be something that we're not and just put ourselves out there and begin to let God work through us. And as He's working through us, He's going to be working through a vessel 
that he's cleaning up and that he's taking care of and that he's polishing and he's making better each and every day. God is trying to do something great in our lives. You and I, if we're not living correctly, it's probably not a great idea for us to be the one that's preaching to others about doing well and doing great. You and I need to realize that God can, can do something wonderful for us. The Bible says, Matthew 7, 3 through 5, it says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. There was a lady who wondered why the next door neighbor's uh, washed clothes were hung outside on the washing line always looked so dirty. The white sheets especially appeared to have stains. And so she went next door and she says, how come your sheets always look dirty with stains? You should wash your sheets properly. But one day, then she realized as she was looking at this lady's laundry, that it wasn't the laundry, that it actually was her windows were dirty. <laughs> you. <laughs> you. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.20 and 21. Now in a large house, this is out of the New American Standard, now in a large house there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware. And some of honor and some of dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Can God use people that don't always do right? Well, of course he can. God's God. He can do whatever he wants. But God would really like to take you and I and clean us up. He would rather really like to take you and I and make us vessels for his use. By taking us in our dirtiest stage and actually us standing still long enough and being quiet long enough and, and being available long enough that God could actually do something good for us. That he could clean us up right where we are, right in the midst of all of our storms, right in the midst of, midst of everything. God wants to take us and clean us up and use us for his kingdom. But we just won't be still. We just won't be quiet. We just won't be available for God to do these things. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. God will take care of us. God will honor us. And we'll do it. And then number four, you and I need to be willing vessels. We need to be vessels and, and uh, these things when we're talking about vessels, we're talking about a representation of ourselves. We're talking about primarily Christian people. So to be a useful vessel is whether or not we have a heart to serve God or not. Whether we just want to talk and be good talkers. Whether we want to talk out of both sides of our mouth and, and, and speak one way with one group of people and one way with another group of people, whether we just want to talk about being a Christian or whether we want to actually have actions of a Christian. Whether we want to talk about being someone who follows God or we actually could actually have somebody model what we do because we're actually a follower of God. We need to be willing vessels. We need to be a vessel that wants to serve God. Would an employer want to use an unwilling worker who's always complaining, who's always grumbling, who's always whining, always asking, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to do that? Even if the cup is empty, even if the cup is clean, even if the cup is near, near, near us, we're saying, I hate my job, I don't want to do it. How could God use that cup? When God created us, he gave us a will to choose to do 
right and wrong, to choose him, whether or not we're going to serve him or not, to live for him, whether or not we're going to try to please him or not. God respects your free will. He doesn't make you choose to love him. He doesn't make you choose to serve him. He doesn't make you choose to do this. He gave you a free choice to choose. So why do we always choose something else? And folks, many times we do not choose the easy road. Mm. Many times we choose the hard road. Because later on in our life, when God has finally knocked enough sense into us, we say, why in the world did I go down this road of hard knocks? Why did I choose the hard way? When God has set for an easy path for us, why did we always choose? Why are we so And keep going through the same mess every single time. Not once, not twice, not four times, not five times, ten times, eleven times, up, down, back, forth. We just keep going through the same nonsense every time. Let's take God and grab his body. Never like this. Listen, turn it, turn it, turn it. God just keeps. Scourging post. 
Most people didn't make it through the scourging. They died. And then he was taken and hung in the, in the Israeli sun. They tried to give him vinegar that had a hallucinogenic on it. When he was suffering, when he said from the cross, I thirst. They tried to give him gall, vinegar, hyssop, mingled together. When he looked out on them and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. All of these situations, Christ giving of himself for you and I, dying freely for us. Giving of himself for us, dying freely, willingly. The Bible says that he could have called out and 12 legion of angels would have came and taken him off the cross. He could have spoke and everybody in that scene would have just fell over dead. He could have spoken just the Roman soldiers would have all died. Just the word from his voice would have caused the rocks and the mountains to fall down on everybody. But he didn't speak those words. He just freely gave himself. Do you know how much God loves you? That even in the midst of your own garbage and in the midst of your own stuff, that God picked you out and said, you're the one that I love? That even in the midst of you being who you are and me being who I am and all of my insecurities and all of my bad stuff and all of my frailties and all the stupidity that I've done in my life, that God still says in the midst of all of that that I love you. And I send my son to die a horrific death, pain, agony, torture for you. God loves you so much. He said, I loved you so much that you should love each other. He loves you with a love that is unfettered. He loves you with a love that is not chained down to anything or anyone. He loves you with a love that's beyond compare. He loves you with a love that you cannot look and find it anywhere else except at the cross. He loves you with a passion and a desire because he wants you God wants you to be shaped into the image of his son. Not into the image of a sinful man. Not into the image of a faulty guy. Not in the image of somebody who's tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed. But he wants you and I to be shaped into the image of his perfect son, Jesus. As a group comes back, I want you to know how much God loves you. And I want you to know that how much the world needs us as Christians. The Bible says that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. When you realize how much sin there is in the world compared to how many people really love Jesus, it's overwhelming. It's difficult to fathom. It's tough to understand. David Wilkerson went to the slum area of New York to reach the souls of the group judge, juvenile delinquents, and gangs. He saw their urgent need, and he was impressed to reach them for the cause of Christ. He wrote a book called Cross and Switchblade. God looks at our heart. He looked at a humble, simple shepherd boy named David. When Prophet Samuel went to Jesse's house, David's dad, and he was trying to find the king, he looked at seven sons to be the king of Israel. Samuel thought that the oldest son was going to be God's choice. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the 
looks at the heart. Folks, sometimes you and I look at people and we think they're strong. We think they're big. We think that they can overcome anything. But really, inside of them, man, they're just mush. They've gone through so much. They're just on the brink. God is wanting you and I to know that He chooses you. He loves you. You are the apple of His eye. You are the one that He loves. You are the desire of His heart. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1, 26-29, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were noble. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. So that no one may boast before him. God used a fisherman by the name of Peter. Uneducated unschooled, ordinary. God used a guy who was a shoemaker by the name of D.L. Moody. When he called him, he became one of the most famous evangelists in America in the 19th century. And God did the same for another man who just died recently at 99 years old. Billy Graham. He used a simple man to deliver a simple message that you and I are broken and hurting and sinful before God. And this God of love wants to change all that by taking our hurting heart and making it new. So today, I ask you, I beg of you, will you be the vessel that's close to God that can be used by Him? Are you the one that God can use to change somebody's life around you? Are you maybe here in a situation where you haven't been close to God and you wanted to get closer? Today is an opportunity for you to do that. God can change your world in a moment by you just opening up your heart and accepting His Son as your Savior. Would you stand with me please? As the group begins to sing, you can come up here, we'll pray with you, we'll do whatever we need to do, but God is calling you asking you, will you be a servant that I can be?